no driver support, a bare minimum amount of VRAM, and decade-old tech. The R9 290 has defied expectations for many years, avoiding the landfill by its sheer quality and forward-thinking design. Now, in 2022, the scalper pandemic has gamers dragging old graphics cards back into service once again. However, with the latest games designed with the new console generation in mind, has Hawaii finally been rendered obsolete? With slightly fewer shading units than the flagship 290X, the R9 290 still boasts plenty of horsepower. On paper, this card should compete handily with the more modern RX 470, though to make sure its forced obsolescence isn't unnecessarily kneecapping things here, I'm using Adrenaline 22.1.2 drivers from January this year. How am I doing that, you ask? After all, weren't you just whining about how AMD discontinued support for this and all other early GCN cards last summer? Why, yes. Yes, I was. I talk more about Nime's modded drivers in the video linked below, but briefly, if you have a GCN 1, 2 or 3 based card like this one, this driver package backports new drivers to work on your now unsupported card. If you don't have these drivers, you certainly won't get the same level of performance as I do in every game. Notably, Halo Infinite is practically a slideshow on legacy AMD drivers. Unlike last year's video on the 290X, I'm testing the R9 290 on two test bench configurations. First using an overclocked 6-core Ryzen 5 5600G, and then using a quad-core stock configuration to more closely represent the average gaming PC according to Steam's hardware survey. Given that the R9 290 is approaching the PS4 Pro in terms of performance, it's no surprise that it can run God of War quite nicely at 1080 original settings. Without any messing around, the game gives up 52 FPS on average, and with some resolution scaling we can easily get over 60. Dropping down to a quad-core config has barely any impact on performance either, though as we're undoubtedly GPU bound and playing a game designed to run on Jaguar architecture, this isn't much of a surprise. On the visual side, I couldn't help but notice a fine halo around Kratos as I panned the camera around, and this seemed to grow and become more noticeable as I turned the FSR scaling down. Depending on your taste for sub-60 frame rates, this is a decision you'll have to make for yourself. Final Fantasy VII Remake is looking pretty solid here too, coming in at 70 FPS at 1080 high. Again, the game does use automatic DRS, which is known to soften things up a bit, but I don't find it too egregious. While I believe you can download a user mod to remove this, I haven't tested it myself, so can't comment on how big of an impact it has. Unlike the GTX 970, which scores very similarly to the 290 in this title, I didn't have to drop any settings to keep things running smoothly during cutscenes and more intense moments, most likely because this card actually has 4GB of VRAM. Quad-core owners once more have nothing to worry about here, the game runs about the same on the underclocked RPG PC spec as it does with everything turned up to 11. Coming from the GTX 970, the R9 290 is a delight in Guardians of the Galaxy. With the Nemes drivers installed I'm seeing an average of 54 FPS and lows of 38 at 1080 medium. In fact, the CAND benchmark showed only minute differences as I turned quality up even further, though honestly I have my doubts about how well that will translate into gameplay, as the actual game slows way down in several scenes. I'd be inclined to recommend medium to be on the safe side, though as the game's quite light on VRAM usage, you can feel free to turn textures up to high. The R9 290 was a tiny bit disappointing compared to the GTX 970 in Forza Horizon 5. At 1080 high, the built-in benchmark struggles to reach an average of 50 FPS, which makes it about 8-10% to slower than the 970. In practice, 50 FPS isn't as bad as it sounds, as you'll only be seeing those low frame rates in certain areas of the map and certain kinds of race. What is still annoying is the way the GPU handles alpha transparencies is still messed up, leaving black borders around decals. In the footage this is noticeable in the license plates and the badges on some of the cars, but in a foggy or other volumetric filled environment these black shapes stand out like a sore thumb. I had heard this had been fixed, so maybe the next iteration of Nemes drivers won't have this issue. 
and the disappointments keep coming. Uh, despite a promising result in my tests using an empty arena, actual multiplayer gameplay in Halo Infinite is borderline unplayable at 1080. On the 6-core CPU setup, the game averages a little over 30 FPS in large-scale battles, and only about 30 on the quad-core. Dropping to 75% scaling, or 1440 by 810 can help achieve a 50 FPS average and actually doesn't look too bad, but this is still short of what the 970 was managing at full 1080. Single-player gameplay surprisingly does about as well as the multiplayer, whereas on the GTX 970 it was noticeably slower. This might indicate there's something holding the 290 back, and I'm still holding hope for the possibility of a future driver update that perhaps improves matters. Cyberpunk is still rough going for this generation of cards, but over a year of CDPR trying desperately to fix things seems to have helped somewhat. Looking back at the 290X video from 2021, that card scored 34 FPS average at 1080 low. This time around, the 290 gets a higher frame rate at 1080 medium, averaging 38 with lows of 29. Dropping to low only increases the average to 45, but it's still noticeably more playable. The quad-core setup results in an average ever so slightly below that of the 6-core, but this is within margin of error. With higher-end cards, Cyberpunk can be pretty severely CPU-limited, but in this instance, the GPU is definitely holding things back. Another convincing result for the R9 290, this time in Rainbow Six Extraction. I did plan on playing the game this time, but the non-optional VR training thing annoyed me, and I just ended up running the CAN benchmark again, so sorry for the lack of interesting footage. Nevertheless, at 1080 high, I saw an average of 80 FPS, a sizable 10 FPS jump over the GTX 970. I don't know if people are playing this game, but if they are, this card would be a good choice for it. Even better, it seemed to be completely GPU limited as both the 6-core and quad-core setups scored essentially the same. Splitgate is proving to be a contender for my new favourite eSports title. If you have ambitions to try out a 144Hz monitor, I can certainly recommend the game, and the R9 290 has enough power to do the job even at epic settings. The 6-core setup averages about 165 FPS and only drops to 120 1% lows. The quad-core config is basically identical here, so owners of older i7s should expect similar results. On the subject of stuff I kinda like, I'm enjoying Vanguard more than I expected to. I know, I groused a little in the MPG PC video about giving money to Activision, but what can I say, I'm basic. Different maps give a pretty big swing in terms of average FPS here, but on the whole we're looking at about 90 to 100 FPS at 1080 medium with quality FSR enabled, regardless of whether the CPU is an overclocked 6-core or a stock quad-core. Dropping FSR altogether results in 75 FPS averages, still palatable enough for many people and a good deal easier to see than the upscaled version. Comparing the Fortnite results between the R9 290 and GTX 970 is pretty much a wash. Aspiring pro gamers can drop everything except view distance to low and see averages of 170 FPS at 1920x1080, meaning either card will do as a stopgap until the sponsorships start rolling in. Again, there's a small 5% drop in FPS on quad cores compared to the 6 core setup, which isn't noticeable in practice. Gamers who like shiny graphics can turn everything up to high, again except view distance at epic, and see nearly 70 FPS on average. 1% lows still suck, and as usual this isn't really anything to do with your computer. So while I don't feel like I wasted money on Vanguard, Battlefield 2042 really isn't my cup of tea. This is another game where, compared to the GTX 970, the Radeon absolutely dominates. The 65 FPS average here is about 10% higher than the GeForce gets at 1080 low, but the AMD is running at medium. Dropping the 290 to low sees averages climb over 80 FPS. Alas, despite a good run for the rest of the games today, this is an occasion where quad-core owners might be disappointed. My testing here saw 1080 medium averages, only as high as the low 50s, so 1080 low is recommended. I neglected to test Warzone at 1080 in my last video, opting instead for 720 low. 
This isn't how I play any multiplayer FPS, and certainly isn't how I recommend it, but if you were to do the same with the R9 290, you should see an average FPS just below 100. At 1080, things are still pretty playable, if not quite a smooth feeling overall. Whether you have a newer 6-core or older quad-core, you should see averages between 70 and 80 FPS, and 1% lows in the 50s. I've got to say, this is pretty close to how the 290X scored this time last year. As I usually feel like Warzone has a tendency to get worse over time, this is one instance where it's actually managed to stay about the same. So, kudos? AMD's smart access memory is something that's come up in other people's videos, and as I have access to it, I decided out of curiosity to see if it made an appreciable difference with the R9 290. Having looked at a few titles that are more easily repeatable, only Cyberpunk saw an improvement of more than a single frame, and even that is arguably still within the margin of error. The GPU score in Time Spy was pretty much exactly the same, so I'm inclined to say it's not worth worrying about if you don't have access to SAM or resizable bar on your motherboard. As I write this, buy it now prices on the R9 290 are between £135 and £150, which is better than I'd expected and is possibly a symptom of the lack of driver support. If you can find one for this price or less, and aren't too squeamish about using third-party drivers, the R9 290 could be an early contender for bargain of the year. That being said, the GTX 970 isn't that much more expensive, and you mostly don't have to mess with drivers. Guardians of the Galaxy pending, of course. If you're in the market for a card in this price range, which one you get depends mostly on which games you want to run. If you already have this card, with the help of the Nemez driver set it can be remarkably competitive in modern games. The big exception, sadly, is Halo Infinite, which, even with 22.1.2 drivers, is a bit sluggish for a multiplayer game. Hopefully this is something that will get better with time and development, but if you don't want to risk it, or just don't want to wait, now might be a good time to look at trading it in for a 4GB RX 470 or 480. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.